Hi everybody, um, this is a little video I thought I'd put uh, out to my friends but if anybody else wants to crowd in and, and watch, uh, take your time to watch, then please do. I just thought I'd, I'd explain to you a bit about the piano world and how it works and how, it, just a really short history of it so that you um, understand something of my world and what I'm doing. Um, We'll come to the individual pianos later, but this is uh, this is a workshop uh, showroom. This is a showroom, uh, and we used to have about ten pianos in here at any one time. And this is part of my house, but uh, things have slowed right up what with eBay and everything like that. Pianos go back about two hundred years. Um, originally, they were regarded a bit as a toy instrument whereas the harpsichord was deemed to be the, the main instrument. And then Carl C.P.E. Bach, the um, C.P.E. Bach, who was the uh, son of um, J.S. Bach, really started taking it seriously and writing for the piano. Um, the, main, the main sort of dates for a piano then are around about um, 1790, the 1800s, uh, when John Broadwood, um, the company John Broadwood started, and they were really the people who founded the piano and, and established the piano. Um, and one got sent to Beethoven famously, and he smashed it uh, through the sheer power of his playing. Um, and, oh, and then they um, built a built a stronger one for him or something. By about 1850, the main grands uh, started being built. Um, or rather something like the final form. I say something like the final form, it wasn't quite the final form, but they were a good deal more recognisable. And all the big companies that we recognise today, the three big ones, particularly Ernest Bersendorfer, uh, Bechstein and Steinway, all started in the same year, I think it was 1853. Now by the um, end of the uh, 20, sorry, 19th century, um, so at the end of the 1800s, you've got um, uh, a bit of a fight going on between the German companies uh, and Broadwood and various English companies. Now Broadwood obviously being the inventor of the piano, um, then made a statement a bit like the early IBM statement, which turned out to be absolutely stupid. You remember IBM invented the computer, or, or brought it into its final usable form um, before mass production and they always said oh I don't think the world needs any more than what was it five personal computers or something like that and uh, of course they were totally wrong and Broadwood said, made a complete uh, stupid statement like that they said uh, because we invented the piano uh, we know they are made entirely of wood and the Germans, of course, have long since found that stability of tuning is only gained if you have a metal, a really strong metal iron frame. And uh, the rest was history, really. Broadwood faded into the background at this point, um, and the Germans took over. And the Germans then went on to uh, uh, pioneer the modern piano in it. And you're looking at one right now. This was made about the time of the changeover. So at the time this was made, which would be in the 1890s, you've still got the amazing uh, ornate way it was built. And I'll show you the outsides in a bit. But you've got um, the modern type of innards, which isn't overstrung. That, that means that the strings actually cross over one another here. And that gives you greater length for the bass strings. It's the bass strings that need that length. And in, in fact, in many uprights, the bass strings are longer than in grand pianos, in the baby grand pianos. So you get a richer tone in some of the uprights than you do in some of the baby grand pianos. The other thing is, um, these are hammers, obviously. They, they bang the strings, make a noise. And underneath, you can't see from where you are, but underneath 
are the dampers, the dampers. Now it's a lot better dampening a string after it's played halfway down the string than at the edge. But in England, having invented the piano this way, we carried on for many years putting the dampers right at the edge of the string at the top of the piano, which never was as effective. The other thing with the under dampers, as we call them, is they're sprung loaded. So that's why all the thing, you know, in the last few years, we, see, we had a surfeit of these other type of pianos, which were lower cost to build and lower cost to churn out, between 1910 and 1920. Uh, we're still living with the legacy of some of them, some of them today, although most of them have now been thrown away. Um, but when I started piano tuning in the 1980s, a huge number of pianos that I was tuning, tuning were still these old, inferior build quality pianos. Um, they just they didn't they didn't survive central heating as long as the the better quality pianos. And of course, by dint of them being worse anyway on the inside, as soon as uh, people faded with interest, they, they, they tended to not be exchanged anymore and gradually they were sent straight to the rubbish tip. So now we have quite a few of these, uh, up to about 1920s, um, so the German ones kicked in around 1890s but some 20 years later we started to get a few um, being made, the top echelon of pianos, sort of top 15% were made uh, initially this way, the German way, and then they increased and made virtually took over, took over the whole caboose, certainly by 1930. So anything after about 1930, you'll find uh, will be totally identical to how it's made today. The only difference with this particular one, being an early version, is there's a really weird spring thing going on. So these are the last couple of hammers that uh, I've actually had to deal with, so I thought I'd show you. Um, there's this fiddly loop thing, you see? Just see that loop of cotton there, the blue loop of cotton? And into that, this spring here, right on inside the action. It's very difficult to even get the camera in there. 